Hey guys and gals, I'm Pal, and welcome back to The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild. Today, uh, man, what you're seeing right now is me exploring the southern region around Luralin Village, because I pitched the question to you guys about whether or not you wanted to see me jump immediately into the final trial of the sword, or if you wanted to, me to take a couple episodes off to explore. And the feedback was resoundingly, Go explore. There are some mighty bananas down there, which will help you make an elixir, or I guess not an elixir, a uh, food that gives you an attack boost, so it'll be beneficial. And so that's what I did. And that's what you're seeing right now. Now why am I pa talking in the past tense, and why am I montaging this? Well, listen up. This has never really happened in the history of the channel before, but it, it did, and so I'm making the best of it. Audacity, my voice recording software, has this glitch where every now and then, whenever after I'm finished recording, the timeline will look normal, everything will look fine, and I'll export the clip, and it will be successful. But then, yeah. when I go back to look at it in the editing software, after I've already closed Audacity, I realize that there is nothing in the timeline, uh -huh. and the export failed. It failed without telling me that it failed. And... So in the case here, I recorded three episodes, it took me four hours and five minutes, and what I got was a bunch of footage, but no commentary. Yeah. And so, rather than re-record four, four hours of footage of an open world game that's blind, I figured I was going to try something new and montage this. So you can already see that I have... Collected a bunch of Korok seeds, uh, that was normally just off-screen, I was going to show that in an end slate, but I decided it was a good opportunity for me to explain what happened. And I'm also going back to the flying challenge, which we encountered on the uh, deserted isle um, south of Hateno Village on the coast. And we didn't have enough stamina when we went through it the first time, and so I decided to tackle it again now that I have stamina restoring items, and also a fairly substantial stamina bar, and you can see that it's it's still going strong despite me flying for a long time, so I, I'm basically, this is the perfect time for me to tackle this, plus I wanted to see if it gave any rewards, like the Goron Climbing Challenge did, uh, and that gave, I think, a shrine and some other stuff, some rupees, and so I was hoping maybe this would give a equally great reward, maybe some flying gear or something, I don't know, this game is blind. And so right now I'm taking the easy path. And I say that mainly because it's it's really high off the ground and it's really it's kind of difficult to fail except for that one portion where we kind of where we fall a great distance and uh, have to pull the chute right next to the ground. This one isn't too difficult. So at this point I had used up all of my stamina restoring food and I was also kind of bushed from all of this. So I decided to take a little break. You know, just to uh, relieve some stress, like normal people do it when they go and kill someone. But no, really, I actually did take a break because I'd run out of food and so I, I needed to cook up some more. And when I was in Zora's Domain, buying some stuff and cooking some stuff, I encountered uh, this little tyke. And he had a quest for me. I had seen him right when we had first arrived in Zora's Domain, but... We were always doing something at the time, and so I never got around to talk to him. But sure enough, he has a quest where he wants us to bring home frogs for him. And apparently he's doing this to raise money, even though he can, you know, he can fish and probably get nice fish, but instead he's getting frogs. But I believe I do have about 5, 10 hot-footed frogs since I've been buying them from Beetle whenever I see them. So I'm able to give them to him. And that will net us our reward, which is not quite what I was expecting. He counts them all out. And then we get an armoranth. As if we couldn't go to any field and pick up a dozen armoranths, he gives us an armoranth. But hey, it's another side quest scratched off the list, so I won't complain. So now with some good items under my belt, or in my lunchbox, I guess, he is, or Mimo, I guess I can't tell if it's a he or she, is prompting us to take a different path. Now this is the path we're more acquainted with, with our first attempt at this challenge. And actually, if I can be honest, this is the harder path. It feels a lot like Pilot Wings for the 3DS or... 
for the, I believe it was N N E S, I think? In that it makes a lot of sharp turns, it takes you very low to the ground, but it's actually not that difficult thanks to my superior uh, skill at pilot wings. Uh, you didn't see that. Any difficulty, I'm able to just sail on through this and, and continue on my merry way, and it's not that bad. I mean, you know, I haven't failed at all at this point. It's it's a perfect run, so I don't know why I had so much trouble with it the first time. Uh, okay, that was a little bit close. So they have a bunch of updrafts, uh, like I said, and I'm not even tapping in. I also, at the Zora's Domain, I got an extra stamina bar from sleeping in their waterbed. So I'm not even really even tapping into, into it at this point. It's pretty easy, although this geyser is a little bit weird, and uh, yeah. But it's fine, I, I can tackle this no problem. Yeah, like that. With, through the magical, magical power of editing, I can carry on through, and I can end my run with 34 rings to my name. He is impressed with us, but we get the same reward. This gave me an idea. I started off with the high course once again, but this time, I, I realized that there was potential for abuse in this course. Right here, we're high enough that we don't necessarily have to end the end our run on that mountain like this course demands. Instead, we can just get the next couple of rings and then take a left. You can see I'm angling the camera towards where I, I would like to continue. Eat some food to restore stamina, and then I can pick up on the intermediate or the low path as if I started with it. So I can just drop down. It's kind of close, but you can see I'm already approaching my my best score of, what was that, like 30? I think we just passed it. So I can just do this, and as long as I have food that restores stamina, it was a little bit close, I can continue to just fly. I mean, not forever, because eventually gravity does uh, take its toll. But... I'm at 44, so I, at this point, I'm wondering if if there's a video out there of someone somehow getting every single ring. But as for me, my best score was 51 by doing a hybrid course of the high and low pads. And sure enough, Mimo gives us a better reward than he did before and unique dialogue. So the reward here is a gold rupee. Now, I'm not sure if this is if this is the greatest reward, or if there's something else, like maybe it's possible to get every single ring. Uh, the potential I can think of for this happening is by shooting a fire arrow, start it, and making a, your own updraft, and maybe that can that can help before you even start, because once you start, you're not allowed to to continue, or you're not allowed to use items. So maybe that's a potent. There's some potential there. All right. So in the Lurelin village. There actually isn't that much to explore. There's this uh, this inn, and there is this uh, this very be beautiful shop. Whoa, there, buddy! Those aren't your chest to open. So this guy told me that I can gamble, and this is the classic gamble Zelda gambling mini game. It's sort of like uh, what hide the hide the shell is that what it is or um. That one game where you flip things around and you have to watch the the one that has the like the the, the cups that have the the money underneath of, of them. It's sort of like that, except you don't actually get to watch them. You just have to guess. And in Link's Awakening, I was a I was a whiz at this. I don't know how I was able to do it, but I was able to predict where the good reward was in every chest in Link to the Past, and I would just rack up insane amount of money insane amounts of money that way and here I mean I I expected that I would have a relatively easy time and so wh what do you do when you have money that you just worked for that you spent and ate a bunch of food to fly your little sail off and make up to 1200 rupees you know you gamble it all away because what what fun is there in living safely when you could just make more money by gambling all of your hard-earned cash. It, it makes perfect sense. So, 
what he's going to expect is I'll never go for the middle one. And so what I do, it's a really refined strategy, is you just go for the middle one. If it doesn't work out, then that means it has to be the middle one next time. And you can see I'm trying to detect which chest it is and not having any luck. I'm wondering if maybe if I use the Sheikah sensor on a rupee or something, it might tell me wh uh, which chest has the has the goodie. But for now, it's just a game of luck. I even tried taking out the Master Sword. Nothing's doing it. I can't scry with this. This isn't Skyward Sword. So I just go for my strategy. Go for the middle chest. They'll figure out the pattern and... You know what? It was a green rupee now, but that means that it has to be a gold rupee the next time. So I just go straight for that middle chest, and again, it gives me green rupee. So, you know, I bet all my money again, and here's my theory. The middle chest has to have a gold rupee here. Just has to. It doesn't. So, you know, this time I... It it sh it seems like he's always making the middle chest be a, a green rupee. So I go for the left chest because this one will be the silver or the gold, and it's not. And it's not. Well, uh, going over to the shop here, I still have a few pennies left in my pocket if the debt collectors don't catch up with me, and so you know I can I can buy things like fish and crabs. Uh, iron shell crabs increase my defense, which you know who doesn't like defense. And specifically, they have, uh, well, they have armored porgies as well, so I can make a really good defense food. But they also have mighty porgies, which is a new, en uh, not a new enemy, a new fish. So mighty porgies increase my attack power, and mighty bananas, which are found in this area, which eventually we'll stumble across them, those also increase my attack power. So, in theory, I, I am now set to go to the the Cave of Ordeals, or the, uh, the Trial of the Sword, or whatever they call it. So, I can just go now, but I still have some exp exploration to do. I need to track down the tower of this area. You know, I need to, to shoot this, this bison, or this bull, or whatever it is. And, mainly, at this point, all I need are shrines and Korok seeds. Because going into a shrine, or into the Trial of the Sword, with a bunch of hearts, that's pretty much my dream, and it's the most op optimal way to do it, if I can pair uh, maximum health with an attack boost. And, honestly, the inventory does carry over as well, so it makes a lot of sense. So, getting deeper into what I like to call Noctilum, because if you compare this to Xenoblade Chronicles X's Noctilum, they're pretty much the same, and the areas were even made by the same people, so it's basically Noctilum. Uh, there are there are two gimmicks that you'll start to notice as this video goes on. As I rescue these people, you know, you always have to rescue the people. They have they have good items. Like, case in point here, uh, I defeat this guy, and the woman, or, yeah, it's a woman, gives us an energy, energizing honey, cr honey crepe, which is pretty good. It restores, what, nine hearts? And also some stamina? That's pretty good. But, like I was saying, there are a couple primary gimmicks in this area. The first of which is that the dragon that's in that as far as I can guess, there are four major dragons in the world, probably Farin, Lineru, uh, Elden, and uh, Ordon. This one gets on your case. I found that out real quick. This one practically follows you around and it's always flying low at almost every time of the day. So getting the scale here is going to be really easy. I just have to find the the fountain or the uh, is it a fountain the the fountain of power or whatever the spring. I have to, fi I have to find that first. But the other gimmick of this area of Noctilum is that there are rewards everywhere. There are very few shrines from what I found, but there are a lot of Koroks and there are s specifically a lot of chests in the water. I don't think we're going to be getting to it quite yet, but pretty soon, you'll start seeing an obscene amount of chests. You can see there's my destination, the tower off on the right, and also some stables, which I haven't seen in a while, so it's it's always appreciated. So I can pick up my horse, Sif, here, although really with how many sharp inclines are in this area, he's not going to be particularly useful. But what we're really interested in here is the shrine, because with the final trial of the sword so imminent, I just want hearts at this point. 
So the Shiato Shrine, as always, I have to check what's behind it. Even though I, there is never anything. Well, I guess I guess there is one in the the Zora's Domain Shrine. But the Zayoto Shrine, Halt the Tilt, is one of the jankier ones we've encountered thus far. So we have these seesaws, right? We have to stasis them to be able to climb up. There isn't really anything of substance around. But this is the gimmick. Just halting these these slopes to get through the area and even getting to the the hidden treasure of this of this shrine isn't too difficult i mean we just halt it a certain way and then walk up it's even set up for us and then this one you kind of have to jimmy the thing to run up it in a really weird fashion and then they they have this weird array here you can see and at first I try to use stasis to launch myself up to that chest, but that doesn't really work, as you can see. So I use the only other object in the shrine, which is the chest, to launch myself up there. Since, since this recording, or I guess not since this recording, but you guys have said that there are often multiple solutions to different shrines, and this is the one that I, entail I employed, but... I really can't think if there's any other solution to that one. It's really weird. All right, so there isn't much to ha much that happens in the stable. This is the only person of interest who's scared about the lightning striking around. Please, could you go try and find out why this keeps happening? You will? Really? I'm so happy. I'm counting on you. So we get a side quest, and I'm not even going to show any of the other dialogue because there's nothing to say. Tracy's rumor mill, the book on the table, only talks about bloopies, those blue rabbits which you see around in woods and you can shoot them with arrows to get rupees. And we've read that before. So it's... This area is a lot of... A lot of no-substance things. You get a bunch of small rewards, a bunch of ambushes that happen, although those are probably just procedurally generated and I was just kind of lucky slash unlucky with the spawns there. And I'm pretty deep into this area at this point. Uh, and so I need to start getting to the tower. Now, I recorded three episodes in this recording batch, which was four hours. But just to streamline things, I'm only going to be recording two. Or I'm only going to be making two of this. So with the power of montaging, this is going to be shortened a little bit. Just because I'd rather not extend this style of commentary over to three episodes. I'd rather only last a week. So, immediately after getting here, I actually ended the episode, but I'm not doing so here. In fact, we're only three quarters through the episode, so buckle in, buckle up, we have a lot more to go. There are a bunch of these little tomb-like things everywhere, which took me a long time to, to knock off. Some of them didn't quite work properly, but they have some pretty good rewards in them. And the area isn't too big. It's mainly ocean and mountains, and there there can't they can't put that much on there. And as you can see, a lot of the surrounding decor is just dedicated to Koroks. We've seen uh, the the event where you have to shoot the balloons. We've seen this. A lot of the decor is just dedicated towards accumulating Korok seeds. There's this one which we need to place durians in both sides in order to get our Korok. And it's just this huge monolith dedicated to just a Korok. But hey, at least we got Mighty Bananas. Mighty Bananas are honestly the reason why I came here, because you guys had told me that in order to get the best st or strength increasing items, the Mighty Bananas really do the trick. And there are also Mighty Porgies in this area, so we can just knock them out and accomplish or kill two birds with one stone. And you were right. So, starting episode after next, we should be able to just jump right into the the Trial of the Sword without too much difficulty. With, uh, with maybe a, a 5 or 10 minute attack boost to help start us off. I'm really dreading that. It's That's going to be so difficult. Just judging by how difficult the the first or the second trial was, it wasn't that hard, but it was also really just a, a war of attrition. I had to, man, I had to 
take so long to get through that. That was like three or four episodes just to go through that. So, as you can see, Lake Floria, which is what this is, is not immune to its, uh, to its stone taluses. But at least they're no different. They're not like water stone taluses or anything. And we can half help them with the first attack. Oh, and also, in case you're wondering, stasis does work on stone taluses, which is really broken and should be changed in the next Zelda game. Alright, while well, this guy picks up his rocks, I can deal the finishing blows, knock him off, and get our reward. As if I wasn't already loaded enough when you look at my the gems in my inventory. You can you can see that this is a, a substantial bolstering to my wallet. Alright, starting with those small chests that I was talking about, this is just it's crazy. They're all just floating in the water. Some of them are deep underwater. And they're just all there. And then as soon as that happens, literally like seconds after, the dragon shows up and he's like, Hey, I'm a dragon and I'll shoot things at you. So like, so much of this area is just kind of in your face at all times. There's this dragon which keeps nagging you, throwing his scales everywhere. I'm trying to get multiple scales here, but it won't work. You can actually get the horns off these guys, too, so I should probably get around to doing that. If I can find a use for them, or if you guys can tell me a use for the dragon scales, that would be great. But the scale landed over there, and I actually did find out that it, is, it does persist through you drowning. Not game overs, probably, but off-screen, I did drown. I ran out of time to swim, and it, it stuck around, so that is good to know. It doesn't just respawn after 30 seconds. See, more chests with a lot of rewards just getting me all the richer, even though I have nothing really to spend my money on. I can buy ancient gear, maybe, but I don't need all of this, all of these provisions. And I really don't know what the purpose of this area is. You, you guys wanted to see me explore it, but there isn't really a reason for it existing. It just has a bunch of treasures and a dragon. No... No giant quests, no, no, uh, Korok, uh, Korok forest, no master sword. It doesn't really, not, not even a maze. It just doesn't really have much of anything. Just a lot of Koroks and a couple of shrines and that's it. And of course, a bunch of waterfalls. Speaking of shrines, there is one, conveniently, and for the first time, I think, that we've encountered thus far, something is actually hidden behind a waterfall. It's about time. The Soda Shraw uh, Shrine. I don't want to undersell this shrine, but it's the simplest thing in the world. You hit this with the right timing. You hit this. You grab this chest, you grab this key, you open the door, and you're done. That's it. More Koroks. I, I could leave these for the end slate, but it's just... I have to point out exactly how many Koroks are in this episode. Future Pal, or I guess that's me. I'm gonna put on screen what my Korok count was at the very beginning of this video, because I'm post-commentating this while playing it in my editing software. So future pal, if you could throw in how many Koroks we've gained just up to this point, I, I'm pretty sure it's around eight, which is crazy. And now that we've gotten all those small chests and little rewards, although honestly, they do, they do and did add up quite a bit. I'm going to end the episode there. Don't worry, next episode won't be more of this. Well, it'll be more post-commentary, because honestly, I feel like this is the best way to do it. But it won't be more small chests and uh, reward montages. In fact, next episode, we're going to be fighting four bosses. That's right, four bosses. So you guys can get hyped for that. Thank you guys so much for watching. Also, next episode will be the last episode of post-commentary. So don't worry, you can get back to my live reactions with the game. 
pretty soon. Thank you guys so much for watching. If you enjoyed this episode in any capacity, please click like. If you didn't, then drop a comment telling me how I could make the next episode so that you would like it. Once again, I apologize for the post commentary, but in a game as big as Breath of the Wild, redoing a four hour recording and trying to retrace my every step, getting every Korok, getting every gem that I got before would be a nightmare. And I would have to do that because if I didn't, then I would be confused for the rest of the LP about what I actually did and did not get in this area. So I feel like this is the best way to do things, even though it's a style that you're not quite used to. All right. See you guys next time on a Monday or a Wednesday for another episode of The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild. See you guys then. Ah! Whoa. Okay, uh, I'm spraying this guy with bitter. Spray, kill him, kill him, kill him. Yeah, okay. Uh, I, I'm glad I remember this. So, traps galore. Uh, I... Mm. Post-commentary jump scare!